right, well, good morning again, everybody. Uh, it is so really good to have all of you with us as we are continuing on in our sermon series here called Build This House. If you missed it, uh, we, we launched this series last week, and we just kind of camped out on the big idea that the house of God, like the real house of God, uh, today is not made up of uh, brick and mortar, but rather it's made up of people. It's made up of flesh and bone. Like we are God's house. It's a beautiful thought. And then we looked at the very exciting thing that God is building his house. Uh, person by person, right? It's, we looked at that uh, illustration last week. Like it, he's, he's building it not with stones, but living stones, right? That's, that's what we are. We are a constructive material designed to be in a construct with other believers, Right? And so what does that mean for us? Well, it means that we need to pick up a hammer and swing. Yep. Right? Like, we, we, God invites us into the greatest building project of all time. That is like building his house, the church. And it takes all of us. So last week, we did this kind of whole big build up, and we were leading up to this big moment. And kind of hit the end. I said, all right, so here's what we're going to do. Text the word serve to the number on the screen. And we threw it up there and we accidentally put the wrong phone number on the screen. <laughs> There's some dude like in Finland right now getting all these text messages. <laughs> Serve. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so let's throw it back up again. So here it is. If you want to be a part <laughs> of this house, if you want to help uh, build this house right now, listen, here it is. Text the word serve to this number. Okay, uh, what's 1-833-202-2834. And, and, and really, Parkwood, it is going to take all of us. So like, as Rachel just said in the video, uh, we are going to two services next week. We are running out of room here. We're running out of room in the parking lots. We're running out of room uh, in our kids' ministry. Well, we have run out of room in our kids' ministry already. And so we, we have to make some changes. So moving forward to all the parents that are in the room, you should know this, uh, just so you kind of understand where we're at and some of the problems that we're facing. Right now, uh, we are ready that starting next week, we have a fully manned kids department for the 9 o'clock service. For the 11 o'clock service, uh, we, we still need more people, I said last week, to hold babies in Jesus' name, okay? Uh, we need your help. We need more people to be able to go in and help support. So starting next week in the 11 o'clock, we're going to have from JK up, uh, but in the 9 o'clock is the only service that we're going to have the actual nursery programs going. So uh, the need is real. So Park would help build this house. Text the word serve to the number on the screen, and you can get involved and help us move forward. All right. Build this house, the series that we're in. If it's true that God is building his house, I, I think it just kind of begs the question this morning, well, what type of house does God want to build? I think that's a very good question. How many people know that just not all homes are healthy? Nope. Right? Uh, so if, if God is building his house, the church, like, what does he have in mind? What are, what are some specific things that, that he wants to build? And really, that's the, that, that's the question. That's like the, like the launch pad that we're going to be jumping off of every week for the next uh, little while, looking at specific things that we believe that God wants to build. Well, today, uh, I feel very strongly that as we kind of move into this, that, that really what God wants to build here is a house of hope. Let me hear you just say that out loud. Say, house of hope. House of Hope. If you've got a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 20. We're going to hang out in uh, John's gospel uh, mostly today uh, in chapter 20. But I, I, I think I'll start here. Throughout history, there have been many events or situations that have just changed the course of life as we know it. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, MLK and the, the, the civil rights movement, uh, COVID was a big one. I don't know if anybody's looked into like artificial intelligence and where that's all going right now. I'm like half excited and half scared, um, you know, but like there's stuff that like it's going to change things. 
And, and, and although that that's true, I would also argue this morning that nothing has changed the world like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing. The, 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 the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And, and here's why. And we kind of have to start here. Hope died when Jesus died. Hope died died when Jesus died. You see, after Jesus was crucified, and I know this is going to seem like a really big statement, uh, but there really were no believers. Like, after Jesus died, seemingly from the scriptures, everybody gave up hope. Like, there is not one account of anybody holding on to hope, not one. Nobody was going to launch a movement in Jesus' name. Nobody was going to keep his teachings in circulation. Nobody was going to start Christianity simply because there was no Christ. Hope died when Jesus died. When Mary and the ladies went down that one very famous morning down to the tomb uh, to see Jesus, they didn't go because they thought that he was rising. They went because they thought that he was smelling Remember, like read in the story, they, 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 they went with spices and embalming oil uh, to put over his body for fear of the stench, right? And, and then when they show up and the stone had been rolled away, uh, l- listen to what they, they thought. John 20 verse 2, it says this, this is the woman's response. It says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've put him. When the ladies first saw the empty tomb, they didn't think he's alive. They thought somebody stole his body. It wasn't until moments later when these angels showed up and told them, no, 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 no one stole his body. He lives, that they got excited, right? But they weren't excited going there. They didn't actually believe he was coming back to life. They thought he was dead and he was staying dead. But the women now have this message from the angels. So they run to the men, to the disciples, and they they go to tell the disciples the message. And we actually read this in Luke 24, Luke's gospel. Uh, Verse 11, it says this. But they, this is the disciples, it says, They did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. The women weren't expecting it. The men weren't expecting it. Those closest to Jesus weren't expecting him to come back to life. All of them were expecting Jesus to stay dead. Why? Because hope died when Jesus died. And then all of a sudden, something happened that changed everything. All of a sudden, in the midst of their grief, in their despair, in their loss... Jesus' heart started beating. His lungs started breathing. Blood started coursing through his veins. Parkwood, yes, it's true that hope died when Jesus died, but it is also true that hope rose when Jesus rose. Like, I mean, this is the message. This is the gospel message of of Christianity. What's fascinating, when Jesus came back to life, he didn't immediately ascend into heaven. What he actually did for 40 days, 4-0, 40 days, Jesus just kind of walked around appearing to people, like just showing himself to different people, like the hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people. And with every interaction, hope was growing. With every person that saw him, hope was just like infusing the land in this hope that started A long time ago, with Jesus' resurrection, it has not stopped until now. Parkwood, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the last 2,000 years, Jesus' church, Jesus' house has been a house of hope. Our house for the last 100 years, we have been a house of hope. And, and, I, and I, I, want, I, want, I want to show this to you. Uh, we can actually trace this back in our history. I, I think it was the first week in January of this year that I, I, I kind of told you some of these stories, but it's so good. I just want to tell it to you again. Um, go, where, anybody want to go to school right now? Sure. Some of the, like, the kids that are still in the room, you're like, no. Uh, we're going to go to history class, okay? Parkwood history class. We're all going to school. 
The year was 1923, 100 years ago. This church started with a small group of believers, both men and women, black and white, from Detroit and Windsor, who all got together in a house to pray. And out of that prayer meeting, very specifically, right, the prayers of God, what do you want to build here? What do you want to do here? What, how do you want this house to look? What are the blueprints? <laughs> and interestingly, out of this prayer meeting, one of the very first things that they did in 1923, they rented out a dance hall on Olette Avenue, and they held evangelistic uh, campaign meetings for five months without stopping. And during this time, many people professed a new hope in the resurrected Jesus. But it wasn't just in 1923. It wasn't just at our inception. We can actually track this all the way through. It, during the 1950s, there was a pastor here named Willie Fitch. Okay? Willie pastored this church for 30 years, which is, just in case you don't know past, pastoral lengths, that's wild. Okay? 30 years. During these 30 years, he would frequently go door to door, just knocking on people's doors and and, you know, saying, hey, uh, I'm a pastor, this is our church, letting them know. And, and many times people would in, just invite Willie into their house, and he would share the gospel of the resurrected Jesus with them, and many people got saved and put their hope in Jesus Christ. That was in the 50s. I mean, you can track this through. In the 1970s, under Pastor Jack Council, we would send out, yeah, there's some Jack Council fans. That's awesome. We would send out a fleet of buses every single morning to pick up kids from around the city. What would happen on Saturdays, teams would go out and they'd knock on doors and they'd tell parents, listen, a bus is going to come by tomorrow and uh, we just want to take your kids to church. We're going to put them on the bus. We're going to bring them to church and then we're going to drop them back off. And the wild thing is that parents said, okay. <laughs> Have my kids, please take them. You know, like it was a different day. <laughs> It was a Every Sunday, we would send out about 20 buses and fill them with kids from the community that would come in and they would hear the gospel of the resurrected Jesus and many kids put their hope in him. It was amazing, but I think we just have to ask the question, why? Why do evangelistic meetings in the 20s? Why go door to door in the 50s? Why... Uh, send out a fleet of buses in the 70s? Why have we done productions? Why do we do We Love Windsor initiatives? Why in 12 minutes from now are we launching another church in the downtown? Why? Why? Be, honestly, because, because we just believe right from the very beginning that God gave the blueprints to his church, and it is this, that the resurrected Jesus alone is the hope for humanity. The resurrected Jesus alone is the hope for Windsor. This is a house of hope. We are a house of hope. This is the house that Jesus is building. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that every day is going to be easy. In fact, that doesn't mean <laughs> that we're not going to have moments of doubt. You know, I already told you that when Jesus came back to life, that, I mean, hope died when Jesus died, but then hope rose when Jesus rose. Like, it was electric, right? Like, like especially for, like, the disciples of Jesus Christ. Like, I mean, it was compelling. All but for one person. Thomas. Thomas. Thomas was in a different camp. And, 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 and I actually want to share some of Thomas's story with you this morning because I relate so well with, with this story personally. But let's, let's just read John 20, uh, verse 24. It says that this, Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, the question is, why is he saying this? 
well, it was right in here. He's saying this because he wasn't there. But when Jesus appeared to all the disciples in resurrected form, Thomas wasn't there. And therefore, when hope was rising all around him, Thomas was falling into despair. It goes on to say this in verse 26. It says, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. So very famous story right here, right? The disciples are in a locked room, and then all of a sudden it's like, bam! That was just to wake some of you up. Bam! <laughs> There's Jesus. <laughs> he just appears. Like, and he, he didn't like pick the lock like a burglar. He didn't come down the chimney like Santa Claus. He, he's God, resurrected God in human flesh now, resurrected body. He just appears. This is shocking. It's meant to be shocking. It, it, but there's something else in here that I think is very shocking as well. It, it, it says here that it was one week later. It, I just want you to think about that from Thomas's perspective. Thomas had to go an entire week with hope rising around him. Thomas had to go an entire week with hearing all of his friends say, like, I've seen the Lord. <laughs> Thomas had to go an entire week. Can I just say, that's a long time when everybody else around you is having this experience and these sightings and you have seen or experienced nothing. And then there's this moment. You're in a locked room. Boom. Jesus shows up. I mean, he's there. The same Jesus who just days earlier, like he died a death by professional Roman executioners. Which, by the way, one of the, <laughs> one of the most ridiculous arguments against the resurrection is people will say, well, he didn't die. It's the swoon theory. They just said he just passed out. That is, that is ridiculous. These people were professionals at what they did. They killed Jesus. Amen. Dead. And then he's in the room. He's in the room physically. He's, he's real. He's tangible. He's, he's there. And, and then in the story, it's, it's amazing. He, he walks right up to Thomas. And he says this in verse 27. It says, then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. <laughs> Jesus tells Thomas to stop doubting. And the more that I think about this, I, I think there's multiple layers at this point to the doubt. You see, I, 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 I don't think that Thomas was just doubting the resurrection of Jesus. Seven days later, I think he's doubting his relationship with Jesus. Seven days later, I, I think he's in a weird headspace right now. I, I think he's, like, like you got to imagine, like, what's going through his mind? Can you imagine the questions that he had on day seven of not seeing Jesus? What's wrong with me that he won't show himself? What's wrong with me that everybody else gets to see him? Have I done something wrong? Did I mess something up? He's got doubts on doubts on doubts. And then he's there. He's real. He's in front of you. And Jesus says, touch me. See the holes in my hands. See the hole in my side. I'm real. I was dead. And now I'm alive. Amen. And what does Thomas say? Does he turn to Jesus and say, where were you, Jesus? Why? Why did you wait so long? Now, he doesn't say any of that. Look, verse 28. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. When presented with the resurrected Jesus, none of that mattered anymore. None of it. He just turns and says, my Lord and my God. Seven days later, Thomas's hope was restored. But it does beg the question. Like, let's just go here. 
Why seven days? You ever thought about this? Maybe you've never made the connection that it was seven days and you're just thinking about it right now. Like, why does Jesus take so long in revealing himself to Thomas? I gotta be honest, I don't, I don't think I fully understand this one. I've, uh, I've, I've read a lot on this. I've read commentaries and articles and I've seen people take certain guesses at why seven days and there might be things in there that, that might be true. To me, there's only one thing that stands out very clear on why Jesus would take so long to reveal himself to Thomas. And it's this, that all of this story was foreshadowing what you and I would have to go through every single day. Every single day. Listen to Jesus' words as this whole story finishes in verse 29. It says, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you've believed. But listen to these words. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Thomas had to go seven days with people proclaiming that Jesus is alive and not seeing him. I've done the math. I've had to go 14,117 days of hearing that Jesus is alive and not seeing him. What's your number? How, how, long, how long have you been waiting? Now listen, as I say that, I, I'm not saying that there's not good reason to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, quite, quite the opposite. We have amazing evidence to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. The tomb was empty. Hundreds upon hundreds of people saw him. Uh, the, the resurrection was actually confirmed by Jesus' enemies. Uh, think about this. Jesus' own biological family worshipped him as God. What would you have to do to make your family worship you as God? Honestly. Or how about the fact, like, how do you account for the disciples' newfound courage? Why were so many willing to die such horrible deaths? And then on top of that, you actually just have the uh, non-Christian secular historians, Josephus, Pliny the Younger, uh, Suetonius, all writing in and around this time about a resurrected Jesus, either implied or, or other things. But it's, it's wild. Like, it's, we have really good reason to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but the fact remains that I still haven't seen him. And yet I sit under these words right here. Jesus says, and blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Worship team, you can come on back up. I'm, I don't know. We'll see how long this goes. <laughs> Parkwood, I, I believe that Jesus knew this day was coming. I, I believe that when, when, when Jesus said that comment, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, I, I think on, like God knew that we would all be together in this room right now. God knew that we would be launching another church. God knew all this stuff. And, 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 and I also think that God knew that even as I say this, that right now, that there would be people listening to me who are Thomases. I think that God knew that like in this room right now, there are doubters. I, I think that God knew that some of you, you're, you're doubting the resurrection of Jesus. And for others of you, you're doubting your relationship with Jesus. Whether it's just been a long time and you feel like, he hasn't shown himself to you. And there's doubt. And that's real. And we carry that around and we've got questions and we've got concerns. And, but I just want to encourage you this morning that the house that Jesus is building is a house of hope. This church, we are a house of hope, because you see, this wasn't just Thomas's story. 
Like I said, I, I relate very closely with Thomas uh, in that I eerily associate myself with him. Like, there's so many parallels. I, I grew up following Jesus. And uh, as a later, kind of as a teenager, there was a season for a couple of years that I just, man, I just gave up all hope. All hope. I gave up hope in uh, the church. I gave up hope in this church. Uh, I gave up hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ specifically. Because it just seemed crazy. Like, how do you actually make sense of a man who is brutally murdered and then three days later comes back to life again? Like, it's impossible if you take God out of it. And so I had had a serious season of doubt. Didn't really want to be a part of any of this. Didn't really want to be a part of anything to do with God. And it's funny, I remember exactly where I was. For Thomas, he was in a locked room. And bam, there's Jesus. I was in the back computer room of our house on Stanley Street in Remington Park where I grew up. And I remember this one day, I was just reading. I don't, I don't know what even led me to that moment, I, but there was something there around the, the resurrection of Jesus and so much doubt for me. And, and I started reading through the proofs. Like, do I actually believe this? The Apostle Paul said that, man, if Jesus Christ had not been raised from the dead, then we Christians, we should actually be pitied more than everybody else because everything we believe is meaningless. It's in vain if Jesus did not come back from the dead. That's a big claim. So I'm in this back computer room on Stanley Street. I'm just reading through the resurrection I'm reading through the proofs. Do we have good reason? And I don't know how to explain it to you, Parkwood, but he appeared to me. Not physically. Like I didn't, I didn't see him with my eyes. I didn't touch him with my hands. But I'm telling you, I felt him in my heart. I heard him whispering to my soul. And it was on that day that I, my hope was restored. My hope was, was, was restored. You see, God knew that in this life, there's going to be a lot of moments of doubt. I think that's why we have the story of Thomas. He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So to all the Thomases, out there right now. To all of you who feel forgotten, to all of you who feel like God is a million miles away, to all of you who feel like God has shown up seemingly to every other person except me, to all of you who feel like, what's wrong with me that he won't come? <laughs> I just believe maybe, just maybe, he's showing up to people right now. I just believe that maybe, just maybe, in this moment, just like he appeared to Thomas, just like he appeared to me, maybe, just maybe, there's something happening in this very moment right now that you can't even really begin to explain, but you kind of feel like God is knocking on the door of your heart. To you, what do you do with that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Like Thomas, all you have to do is say, my Lord and my God. All it takes is you turning to Jesus and saying, it's hurt. I don't know why things have gone exactly the way. I don't have all my questions answered. I don't have all my issues solved. But God, right now, I'm choosing, I'm choosing you. For 2,000 years, the church has been a house of hope. For 100 years of our church history, we have been a house of hope. And it's because God keeps saving people. 
God keeps healing people. God keeps calling his children home. And just like he saved people in the evangelistic campaigns of the 20s, and just like he saved people in the 1950s when Willie went door to door, and just like he saved young kids through the bus ministry in the 70s, just like he saved people through the productions, and how he's saving people in the downtown, just like I believe God is speaking to hearts right now. And he's saying, would you just come home? Jesus Christ alone is our hope. Alone is our hope. And so if that's you today, if that's you today, and maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you're just not in a good place right now. Like honestly, like if, if you died today or Jesus returned today, you might actually have questions. You don't know where you're gonna spend eternity. If that's you, listen, I just wanna give you I, I want to give you a moment right now where you can, maybe for the first time, or maybe it's just been a long time, but, but you just know this morning that you want to get right with God. You, 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 want to, you want to profess your hope in Jesus Christ alone. Then this morning, I just want to give you an opportunity. And so if we could, everyone, why don't we just stand on up in this room? Listen, if that's you, I promise I'm not going to embarrass anybody this morning. But if that's you, just everyone just shut your eyes. Um, if that's you and just you're saying, I want to come home, I need Jesus in my life right now, uh, I'm just going to invite you. Would you just throw your hand on up? Just throw it up. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks absolutely amazing. There's hands. I'm just looking up in the balcony. Yeah. Yeah, hands almost everywhere. Okay, church, we're all going to just say a prayer together. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. There is power in the confession of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, everyone, I'm just going to invite you to just say this prayer with me. Just say, Lord God, I need you. Lord God, I want you. Come in my life. Heal me. Restore me. Save me. Be my hope. I love you, Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me whiter than snow. Forgive me. I put my hope in you and in you alone. You are God and I am not. So like Thomas's confession, I proclaim, be my Lord, be my God, today, risen Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah. Come on. Let's give God some glory.